Questions? How was break? It's all right. How about yours? <laughs> Any other questions? Oh wait, yeah, we need one of them. Ah, you know, our final isn't until the 16th, so. Yep. So that means the whole show 15? No. <laughs> Well, no, because one of our one of our TAs one of our TAs has to leave early to go see the Star Wars premiere in New York City. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> going in Ithaca. Can you possibly erase that word? It's actually creepy. The sponge or whatever it is. I'll erase it because because it, it could be offensive slash trigger warning slash whatever you know. <laughs> okay, any other any other questions? I, I don't let I figure we should we should make the hard deadline this week or early next week, just so you guys get your act together. You're gonna get you're gonna get one more homework assignment that you don't have to hand in. But that covers material that's fair game for the final. So it has Z transforms and stuff like that on it. What's all this animated discussion over here? What is it? What is it? Yeah. Nice. Is anyone here taking mechatronics this semester? When is the contest thingy? When, what what hours? Okay. All right, any other questions? I almost have your prelims done. I, I literally, I was going to finish them last night, but I was disturbed by some members of the class who came and we had a nice conversation. So I was at CTB. It's probably not a good place to go to grade prelims, but I was getting sick of grading at my house. So. Who was it? Well, someone who took 3253 years ago and was just passing through town. Okay, that was one person. And then two class members whom I won't identify. What's that? <laughs> I'm not going to identify them further, <laughs> except to say it wasn't Ricardo. <laughs> OK. And by the way, people seem to be doing very well on the second prelim, by and large. So I'm impressed. <laughs> OK, so what? You, you don't like that? You don't like that? Well, actually, one thing that I've noticed is compared to previous years, the, the sampling question, people did much better on that by and large than they have in the past. So maybe having the old prelim available help, help with that. I don't know. But anyway, um, we were talking about Z transforms, and I want to finish up very briefly. So especially rational Z transforms. We were talking about situations where you have a signal whose Z transform is a rational function of Z and talking about inverting Z transforms for rational functions of Z using partial fraction expansion and the fact that the regional convergence has to be bounded by poles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. That's all in the monograph and you can read up on that and watch the video note if you weren't around last week. But there's one final item I want to mop up about Z transforms. So one final item 
is Z transforms and BIBO stability. of discrete time systems. Okay, so how does this go? Suppose you've got a discrete time system, so given a system with impulse response H and transfer function, and of course here I'm assuming that the impulse response has a Z transform, so transfer function capital H along with ROC sub H. Remember, to specify Z transform, in particular the transfer function of an LTI system, you have to specify both the formula and the region of convergence. When is the system BIBO stable and how can I tell in terms of the transfer function? So when is system BIBO stable? And first I'm going to state a general result and note, by the way, that there are some systems that are BIBO stable that don't even have transfer functions. That they have an impulse response that's an L1 signal, but it doesn't have a Z transform. And there's examples of those in the monograph. But provided H does have a Z transform, how can we determine by looking at that Z transform whether the system is BIBO stable? Well, here's a basic fact. And this holds for all systems of this kind. The system is BIBO stable if, and this only goes one way, it's a sufficient condition for BIBO stability, the unit circle, which is just the set of all z's of magnitude 1, lies in the region of convergence. And in particular, this doesn't include the situation where the unit circle is one of the boundaries of the region of convergence, but in those cases the system might be BIBO stable. It depends. Now why is this true? The reason is that, and I'm not going to give you the full proof, I'm just going to say the reason is that by definition of ROC, It turns out that when the unit circle lies in the region of convergence, this sum, sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity, h of n, z to the minus n, converges absolutely for all z's that lie on the unit circle. So for all z with magnitude of z equal to 1, hence, if I take the magnitude of all those terms, and if the magnitude of z is equal to 1, it goes away, I get this. So that means that h is an L1 signal. And we know that L1 signal is equivalent to saying that the system is BIBO stable. Okay, so that's like a one-line quickie trip through the proof, and the details are in the monograph. So if the unit circle is in the region of convergence, then the system is BIBO stable. Caution, once again, this does not include unit circle being one of the boundary circles for the region of convergence. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to look at the special case where you have a causal system and the transfer function is rational. So here's a special case. This is the one that everybody talks about. Say the system is causal. And has a rational transfer function. And that is to say the formula part for the transfer function h of z 
is a rational function of z. OK, what do we know? In this case, we know that ROC sub h is what? Well, we know two things. First of all, we know that it has to go all the way out to infinity because h of n is 0 for n less than 0. So ROC sub h takes the form R sub a less than magnitude of z less than infinity because by causality h of n is equal to 0 for all n less than 0. Furthermore, by ROC rules for rational Z transforms, so I'll call those the ROC rules that we talked about last time. And remember what those rules were. If you have a rational Z transform, then none of the poles of the transfer function can lie in the region of convergence. And any finite boundary circle for the region of convergence has to go through one or more poles. So by ROC rules for rational Z transforms, we need to have that R sub A is equal to the maximum of all the poles magnitudes of H of Z. So the maximum of all the magnitudes of the poles of H of Z. So if you graphed the poles, you put little x's in the complex planes where all the poles of H of Z are, and drew a circle centered at 0 through the outermost pole or poles of H of Z, the region of convergence is going to be the part of the complex plane outside of that circle. What does it mean, then, for the unit circle to lie inside the region of convergence? So for such a system, the unit circle lies in ROCH if and only if R sub A is less than 1. Because otherwise, R sub A would be bigger than or equal to 1, and the unit circle would be either strictly inside in the inward part of the complex plane, not in the region of convergence, or a boundary circle. And therefore, all the poles, if all the poles, hence by the above fact, so hence by the fact above, If every pole of H of Z has magnitude less than 1, then the system is BIBO stable. And it's easy, in this case, to prove the converse as well, that if you have a rational Z transform, if the system is BIBO stable, then every pole has to have magnitude less than 1. So let me just note the converse also holds. And the rationality of H of Z is the key. OK, so conclusion, uh, just to wrap this up, summary. When the system is causal and H of Z is rational, then the system is BIBO stable. If and only if 
every pole of H of Z has magnitude less than 1. Strictly less than 1. And that's the most common special case in applications, David. So, um, what I'm trying to like, picture this, I imagine there's a graph of this being an imaginary axis and there's like a unit circle. Yeah. And so we basically want the point to be inside the circle, right? We want all the poles of HC to be in there because we want the region of convergence to include the unit circle. Right. Um, so this is, the yeah. Zeros, are zeros doesn't matter. Zeros have no effect on the stability here, turns okay, out. Aren't they the x-axis? So the, zeros, right? <coughs> the zeros could be anywhere. Oh, right. We're, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so here's, here's the picture. Like if you have a pole here and a pole here, and this is one. And maybe you have a complex conjugate pair like so. This is going to be the ROC, and all the poles are safely imprisoned in this inward region. You know, that, that makes for a BIB. Oh, that's not the ROC. The ROC is this. <laughs> that's the unit circle. Let me, let me fix that. The unit circle is like so, right? And the ROC is like so. So two of the poles in this case lie right on the inward boundary, bounding circle of the ROC, and two of them lie strictly in the inner zone. But in any event, the unit circle is included. All right, so that's the last little detail on Z-transforms I want to include. Any questions about the Z-transform stuff? Before we move on to one more thing. Yes, no? Is everyone like wiped out because it's the end of the semester? Sort of. You have a final? Well, everyone has a final. <laughs> Tomorrow. And what course is that? Okay. It's not legal to have final exams during last week's classes. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I'm sure it's a total honest mistake because Kevin is a really good guy. And I'm sure he just doesn't know the rule. And, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell them that, that Rohit and Nathan told me <laughs> that he's having a final last week of classes. Are you in that class, Amanda? Are you in that class as well? 3,100? Okay, Amanda, Rohit, and... <laughs> No, the, technically what you could do is you could, send a, you could send a polite or irate email to the dean of the faculty and say, we, our professor is giving a final exam during the last week of classes. <laughs> so high-end cookies for a high-end group of people. Well, if you're having a final tomorrow, I'm pretty glad you're here, but what does that mean for tomorrow's 125 to 215? I'll be here. You'll be here. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, it's good to get your mind off the class before the exam, I think. It's a little bit. Okay. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about as much as possible is this thing that's going to seem sort of to come out of the blue, but it's very important in real life applications, and it builds on our vast knowledge of inner product spaces and whatever, and that's the singular value decomposition. So it's this final sort of circle of topics, topic, is this thing called the singular value decomposition. And I, I've heard rumors that you guys, quote unquote, learned about it in linear algebra. Yep. <laughs> Alex didn't, but everyone else did, right? OK. Yeah, singular value decomposition. And we're going to talk about this for arbitrary M by N complex matrices. So they don't have to be square. They don't have to be real. So this is kind of like the most general 
singular value decomposition you could ever look at. And so what we're going to do, first I'm going to go over some, some facts about Hermitian matrices which are square and also that specializes to real symmetric matrices and then I'm going to go into this singular value decomposition and maybe today we'll get to the definition of the singular values I, th I hope we will but we'll see how it goes so first some notation we're going to be using CN as usual is going to be the set of all complex column and vectors with the usual inner product so it's as usual the set of column complex n vectors with the usual inner product v inner product with w equals w hermitian times v where as usual hermitian superscript wh means W transposed conjugate. Okay? So as usual, that's going to be our sort of stage on which we perform all this stuff. And to simplify or minimize chalk use, C to the n, m by n, m by n. This is going to be the set of all m by n complex matrices. And I always wondered why they picked m and n for m by n matrix. It's, it's sort of like to maximize the possibility of misunderstanding a phone call about matrices. You know, no, it's m by n. What n by n? No, m by. N. You know, so I don't know, but we're going to use that anyway. And so C to the n by n is the set of all square complex matrices. So here's a definition. A matrix Q in C to the n by n, so Q has to be square, is Hermitian when Q superscript H, the Hermitian conjugate Q equals Q. That's what a Hermitian matrix is. And notice that if Q happens to be a real valued matrix, which it's allowed to be if it's a complex valued matrix, that's the same thing as saying Q is symmetric. So note, this is the same as Q equals Q transposed when Q has real entries. Okay, and, and all the results I'm about to state for Hermitian matrices, I'm, I'm going to give you like a bulleted highlight reel without any proofs unless you demand them. Okay, and who's our proof demander? I always forget. Yeah, okay. I, I, will, I will exceed to your demand except for one of the results, which is too long. I mean, I, I could just look it up. You could just look it up. I know, but... Well, why don't I call you the proof requester? Does that sound more diplomatic? Yeah. Yeah. When students submit lists of demands, why don't they submit lists of requests? Wouldn't that work better? We request the following. You know. Anyway. So here's some important facts. About Hermitian matrices. First one, if Q is Hermitian, 
then all the eigenvalues of Q are real. That's easy to prove. And I won't prove it unless the proof requester requests it. I can't just say that one. I have to do, yeah, OK. So all the eigenvalues of Q are real. That's one thing about Hermitian matrices. Another fact is that if Q is Hermitian, and say W1, or let's use Vs for you, you, what do I want to use for this? I'll use V1, V2, up through Vk, are eigenvectors of Q corresponding with distinct eigenvalues, say lambda 1 up through lambda k, so all these lambdas are different, then these guys are mutually orthogonal. Now, this is more powerful than a corresponding assertion for arbitrary square matrices. Does anyone remember the following? That if you have an arbitrary square matrix and you have a bunch of eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues, they are linearly independent of each other. Does anyone remember that sort of? It's kind of a linear algebra mantra. In this case, not only are they linearly independent, they're mutually orthogonal. Very cool fact. And I will omit the proof of that unless the proof. OK. OK, so that's another thing. And now something that I won't prove even if you request it. This is the hard one. Q Hermitian implies that Q is diagonalizable in the following sense. What does that mean for matrix? That is to say, there exists a basis, say V1 up through Vn for Cn, consisting solely of eigenvectors for Q, or of Q. That's what it means for a matrix to be diagonalizable. Now, that's not true for any old matrix, but it's true for every Hermitian matrix. And by the way, and in each of these things, as we go along, when it's relevant, I'm going to include the special case when Q happens to be real. When Q is real, you can find a real basis, V1 through VA. So a real eigenvector basis. V1 up through VN. And in the monograph, I put bases in parentheses just to indicate that it's an ordered list of, of vectors. So I'll put that in this case as well. This is the hard one to prove. I'm not going to prove it even if you request it. I just have a question. Yeah. Um, so when you say diagonalizable, <coughs> diagonalizable. Yep. Right? Yep. Uh, that means a lot of the eigenvectors have a lot of zero entries above? No, it means that if you, if you put all the Vs as columns of a matrix U, then if you take QU, you're going to get U 
times a diagonal matrix that looks like this. And these lambdas don't have to be distinct. And that's u times lambda. And if you take u inverse qu, u inverse is going to exist because these are linearly independent. You can get u inverse qu equals lambda. That's why they call it diagonalizable. You can do a similarity transformation, which I think is a glorious piece of terminology that I never use, okay. on Q and get a diagonal matrix. All right? But wait, there's more, OK? Not only does there exist a basis for CN consisting solely of eigenvectors, and Zach has heard all this before, so he can see ya. <laughs> do, you, do you have 3,100 tomorrow? Probably not. No, OK, good. Not only does there exist an eigenvector basis for CN consisting solely of eigenvectors for Q, there exists an orthonormal basis for CN consisting solely of eigenvectors for Q. So this is a strengthened version. Q Hermitian implies that Q is what people call orthogonally diagonalizable. And I always wondered whether J.K. Rowling got from diagonalizable, diagonally, you know, Harry Potter, whatever that thing was. Q is orthogonally diagonalizable. That is to say, there exists an orthonormal basis V1 up through Vn for Cn. And here, of course, orthonormal means with respect to the usual inner product. That's the inner product that holds in the land we're operating in consisting solely of eigenvectors of Q. All right, so that's a good thing. Now, what this means, let, let me, and, and by the way, you could take this to be a real. So by the way, when Q is real, you can choose the V's. Be real as well. Yeah. No, actually, that's equivalent to Hermitianus. Turns out, it was a good question. Dan's question was: Do non-Hermitian matrices exist for which you have an orthonormal basis consisting solely of eigenvectors? And the answer is no. Turns out. Although, actually, let me think a second here. Um, let, me, let me hold off on that, because I think maybe skew Hermitians might, uh, there might be, yeah, I don't want to talk, let me take that back for now. I'll, I'll, I'll think about that and maybe get back to you after the break. All right, so those are really important facts. Now, let me elaborate a little bit on this last one here. So, so let's amplify this last one a little bit. Suppose Q is Hermitian, and I let V1 through Vn be an orthonormal basis for Cn, where each V say VK is an eigenvector of Q corresponding to eigenvalue lambda K. And that's for 1 less than or equal to K less than or equal to N. And by the way, these eigenvalues need not be different.
They can even all be the same. They can all be 1, they can all be 0, whatever. Let's make a matrix U by putting the V's as columns. So let U be the matrix that has V1 as its first column, V2 as its second column, and so on, and Vn down as its last column. What is U inverse in this case, in terms of U? Does anyone know, does anyone, can anyone sort of see what U inverse is just by looking at U and remembering that the V's are orthonormal? It's almost the transpose. It's, no. Terminate, ter well, in this case, U inverse is actually the Hermitian transpose, the, the conjugate transpose of U. Why is that? Because U Hermitian has V1 Hermitian as its first row, V2 Hermitian as its second row, and so on. And when you multiply that times U, you get this. U Hermitian U sub IJ is equal to VI Hermitian Vj, which is Vj inner product with Vi, which is equal to 1 if i equals j, 0 if i is not equal to j, since the v's are orthonormal. And saying u Hermitian u sub ij is that is the same as saying u Hermitian u equals identity. Furthermore, doing the maneuver I did over on the board over there, so furthermore, if you take Q and multiply Q times U, because V1, the first column of U, is an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue lambda 1. I get lambda 1 V1 in the first column, lambda 2 V2 in the second column, up to lambda sub n Vn in the last column. That's the same as u times this matrix that has the lambdas arrayed in order on the diagonal. And I'll call that cap lambda. Multiplying through by u Hermitian on either side gives us u Hermitian q u equals lambda, or equivalently q equals u lambda u Hermitian. OK, so those are the elementary facts about Hermitian matrices that I wanted to remind you of from Math 2940, Linalge. Any questions about this stuff? Does this all sound vaguely familiar, like you had it in a dream state at one point? No. No? Yeah, it's a capital lambda. Yeah, a capital lambda. So in LaTeX, it would be this. And believe me, this is the most typo, like, generative Greek letter, in my humble opinion. So I used to, I actually, I used to alias it as something else, but I quit doing that. Yeah, so Denzel. Is 
this, you'd have the last thing. Right here? Where, what do we, the inverse Hermitian. Inverse Hermitian. No, u inverse is the same as u Hermitian. So if I, if I have q u equals u lambda and I multiply on the left by u inverse, it cancels the u here and puts a u inverse to the left of q. But wait, u inverse is just u Hermitian. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because u, u has orth orthonormal columns. Okay. That's what the ij thing is about. Okay. Yep. Victor. Oh, oh, for it's the serif on my u. I'm sorry. I'll make it more attached to the u. That, was that what was bugging you? Uh -huh. Sorry. Oh, OK, so strictly a typo. Choco, whatever. All right, so any, any questions about this? Does this sound to everyone about Alex P vaguely familiar? You've seen this before, right? Yes. Come on, say yes. All right, OK, good. Well, now let's take the three-minute break, and then we'll start in on the singular value to come. Do you know what he is? I remember I just Okay, so anyway, now let's. Having, having said all this about Hermitian matrices, let's now start looking at arbitrary non square matrices. So recall that, and this is another thing that you're supposed to remember from linear algebra. So if A is a complex M by N matrix, so this is not necessarily square, the null space of A is the set of all V in C N such that A V equals 0. And the null space is a subspace of Cn. That is to say, it's closed under linear combinations, and so on and so on. And the range of A is the set of all W in Cm such that W equals AV for some V in Cn. So if you think of A as defining a linear mapping from Cn into Cm by prescri prescription W equals A times V, the range of that mapping is the range of the matrix A. The rank of A, by definition, is the dimension of the range of A. So that's the definition of the rank. And a fact about the rank, fact, the rank of A is equal to n, the number in columns of columns in A, minus the dimension of the null space of A. So by th all this stuff, the rank is less than or equal to both M and N, where N is the number of columns, M is the number of rows, and the matrix A. And here's a nice formula for the rank. It's the, it's the number of columns minus the dimension of the null space. These are all basic facts from linear algebra that I'm just, again, reminding you of, supposedly. OK, so how does this come into play? Suppose I have such a matrix A, not necessarily square matrix,
and I take a Hermitian. So note that for a in c to the m by n, if I take a Hermitian a, what size is that matrix? Say, say, say it louder so I could hear it over the phone. N by N or M by M? No, which one? N by N. N by N, yes. That is an N by N matrix, and it's Hermitian. If I take the Hermitian conjugate of that, it's easy to show that if you take the Hermitian transpose of a matrix, you get the product of the Hermitian transposes in the reverse order. So A Hermitian, A Hermitian is A Hermitian, A Hermitian, Hermitian, A Hermitian, Hermitian is A. So it's Hermitian. A lot of Hermitians in that sense. So what, what do we know about Hermitian matrices? We know all the eigenvalues are real. We know that they're orthogonally diagonalizable, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's very cool. But more is true here. So here's some facts. First of all, the rank of A Hermitian, A, is the same as the rank of A. And this is easy to show by a dimensional argument. The reason is A Hermitian A and A have the same null space. That's easy to show. And the same number of columns. So by that fact up there, their ranks have to be the same. Does anyone want me to show you in, in half a line why A Hermitian A? Please request this proof. Yeah, OK. Why does A Hermitian A and A have the same null space? Well, clearly, if AX equals 0, or if AV equals 0, that implies that A Hermitian AV equals 0. And all that together implies that the null space of A is contained in the null space of A Hermitian A. Conversely, if I have A Hermitian A, V equals 0, that implies that V Hermitian times that equals 0, which implies that the norm squared of AV equals 0, because this is just the Hermitian conjugate of AV, so this is the norm squared of AV, which implies that AV equals 0. And altogether, that implies the reverse containment. OK, bottom line, important takeaway here is the rank of A Hermitian A is the same as the rank of A. Second cool thing. A Hermitian A being Hermitian has real eigenvalues, necessarily. So the necessarily real eigenvalues of A Hermitian A are all non-negative. It's Hermitian, so it has real eigenvalues. But for this particular kind of Hermitian matrix, one that you get by doing A Hermitian A for an arbitrary A, you get non-negative eigenvalues. Why? That's also easy to show. But I'm not going to do it unless you want me to. Sorry? Sure, OK, fine, fine, fine. OK. So let, let me just do it without putting any words in. OK, if I have A Hermitian A times V0 equals lambda 0 V0, 
and I multiply on the left by V0 Hermitian, I get this. The left hand side is the same as AV0 norm squared. And so now I have positive thing, positive thing has to be non negative. Got it? Okay. So, what, does anyone know what a matrix, all of whose eigenvalues are not, a square matrix, all of whose eigenvalues are non negative, is called? There's a special name for those that we're not going to use in this class. Yeah, Victor. Well, positive semi definite or non negative definite. If they're all strictly positive, it's called positive definite. But I'm going to get away, I'm not going to use that terminology because it clutters things up here. And finally, the, the last little fact I want to point out here is that that the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue of A Hermitian A is the same as the dimension of the null space. And that's true for any square matrix. So maybe I shouldn't list it in this, in this kind of list of facts here. But OK, so I won't. I'll just state it. So since the multiplicity of 0 as an eigenvalue of A Hermitian A equals the dimension of the null space of A Hermitian A. And that's true for any matrix. The, the multiplicity of 0 as an eigenvalue equals its null space dimension. The non negative eigenvalues. of A Hermitian A listed out in, in every, every eigenvalue listed as many times as it appears or whatever as an eigenvalue. So each listed as many times as its multiplicity. And when I say multiplicity, this is all about like repeated eigenvalues, all that kind of stuff, can be listed as follows. They can be ordered. They're going to look like lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, up through lambda r. These are non-zero positive numbers, all of which are eigenvalues, bigger than 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And there's as many of these as n minus the rank of A Hermitian A, or A. So back off, think about this for a second. You have this Hermitian matrix A Hermitian A. It has rank R. The dimension of its null space is n minus its rank. By the way, that rank is the same as the rank of A. So it has 0 appearing as an eigenvalue with multiplicity n minus that. All of its other eigenvalues are real. In fact, they're positive by item 2. And certainly, I can order them from largest to smallest. And there's going to be R positive eigenvalues of A Hermitian A. So the bottom line, we started with this A. In C to the M by N, it had rank R, still does. So here's the bottom line. If A in C to the M by N has rank R, then 
A Hermitian A has exactly R positive eigenvalues. And the rest of its eigenvalues are 0. If we order them lambda 1 through lambda sub r, that's what we're going to do. And the singular values of A This is the definition of what singular values of A are the positive square roots of these. That is to say, sigma sub j is equal to square root of lambda sub j as j runs from 1 up to the rank of A. draw that sigma a little better. So that's the definition of singular values of a matrix. They are the positive square roots of the positive eigenvalues of matrix Hermitian times a cell. And there are R, R of them where R is the rank of A. Now pause here. Some people say these are the non-zero singular values of A and the rest are zero. I, I only use the terminology singular values to refer to these actual positive things. Okay? So those are, that's the definition of singular values. What are they for? What's good about them? There's lots of intuition associated with them, especially when you're talking about square and vertebral matrices. And we'll definitely get to that as we go along. But for now, now that we have the notion of singular values, let's talk about singular value decomposition. What does that mean? So now for the SVD. Starting point, arbitrary complex M by N matrix. So given A in C to the M by N, well, what do we do? We form a Hermitian A. That's a Hermitian matrix, has eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda r and a bunch of zeros. So this uh, given A and C M by N with rank R throughout, I'm going to assume that. So you form A Hermitian A, its eigenvalues are lambda 1 bigger than or equal to lambda 2, bigger than or equal to bigger than or equal to lambda R, bigger than 0, and the rest are zeros. Because A Hermitian A is Hermitian, you can find an orthonormal basis for Cn. So let V1, V2, up through Vn be an ortho basis for Cn. And pick this so that Vk is an eigenvector corresponding to, and this is an orthonormal eigenvector basis. Let me, I'm brushing. Let me just, let me just take a deep breath here. So this is an orthonormal basis for Cn, such that Vk is an eigenvector corresponding with lambda k for 1 less than or equal to k less than or equal to r, and vr plus 1 up through vn is a basis for the null space 
of A Hermitian A, which we have noted already is the same as the null space of A. So far, so good. For each j from 1 to r, I'm going to let wj equal 1 over sigma j times vj, where sigma j, as before, is the positive square root of lambda j. You'll see where the w's come up in a second. Given any vector v in c to the n by n, or c to the n, let's see what happens when I multiply a times v. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand v in terms of this special orthonormal basis. So v is going to equal the sum from j equals 1 to n of v inner product with vj times vj. We can do that because the v's constitute an orthonormal basis. Let's multiply a times v and see what happens. A V equals the sum from J equals 1 to N of V inner product with VJ times A V J. And how many non-zero terms does that have? Well, that's actually a not uniquely answerable question. A bunch of the terms in this sum are zeros. Which ones? Which ones do you know automatically are zero? Remember how we picked the v's. The first r of them are eigenvectors of A Hermitian A corresponding to positive eigenvalues. The last n minus r of them are a basis for the null space of A. So Nathan? Yeah, all the terms for j bigger than r are 0. So this is the same as the sum from j equals 1 to r. r of v v j times a v j. And that's because a v j equals 0 when r is less than j, less than or equal to n. Okay, so that's one thing. Because wj is 1 over sigma j, avj, that should say avj up there. So let's fix that right away. Did I pull it close enough to me to erase? <sighs> Just. Wj is 1 over sigma j avj, because we want the w's to be m-dimensional vectors, it turns out. I apologize for that. So this sum here is the same as sum from j equals 1 to n of, or r, of v inner product vj 
times sigma j wj. Because avj is sigma j wj. And now I'm going to play with this just a little bit more. This is the sum from j equals 1 to n of sigma j times, let's expand this. So it's vj Hermitian v times wj. R, thank you. This middle thing here is a scalar, so we can switch the order. Like so. And I'm, I'm going to elaborate on this just a little bit in a second, because this is kind of weird. You'll see why. And this remains. Uh, no. I'm erasing that. So this is the same as WJ VJ Hermitian. V. And that's the same as the sum from j equals 1 to r of sigma j, wj, vj, Hermitian. All that times v. And this is true for all v. So we started out with av, and we ended up with that strange thing in parentheses times v. A V equals strange thing in parentheses V for all V. That means that A itself equals strange thing in parentheses. And I'll talk in a minute about why I think it's kind of strange. So the bottom line, because that holds for all v, the matrix A itself can be written as the sum of R terms, sigma j, wj, vj, Hermitian. And this is one version of the singular value decomposition. It's the version where you express it as a sum of terms. And there's another one where you express it as a matrix, sum of matrix, sum of matrix. But for now, I want to look at this because it's a little bit odd. Okay, it presents something that maybe you haven't seen much before. What does the, term, the jth term in that sum look like? So let's look at the jth term in the SVD sum. You have this number sigma j. And then you have wj, which is an m-dimensional column vector. And then you have v sub j Hermitian, which is an n-dimensional row vector. So you have this really weird looking thing where you take a column vector times a row vector. That's not something we're used to doing on a regular basis. Maybe you are. I'm not. And wj is m-dimensional, and vj is n-dimensional. So each of these terms is an m by n matrix, which makes sense, because they have to add up to an m by n matrix. And since each term takes that particular form, each term is an m by n matrix of rank 1. And that's another way of looking at the SVD. It's an expansion of a rank R matrix into the sum of R rank 1 matrices. So thus, the jth term is an M by N matrix of rank 1. 
And what the SVD does is express A, which has rank R, as the sum of R matrices of rank 1. And still, you're probably wondering, why would anyone want to ever do this? You know, what's the use? Well, we'll, we'll see why it's important to be able to do that. Denzel. Um, so when you're writing like, n by n, that means like n rows of n Correct. So shouldn't n by n be switched in that way? Because when it's across, then you like n columns. If, if I take like a, say so a 3. One, two, three times uh, 0, 5, 13, 10 to the minus 15. No, let's not make it hard. Um, get it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. OK, so, so that's, the, uh, that's one version of the SVD. The matrix version is if you put the Ws as columns of a matrix capital W, the Vs as, a column, as, as columns of a matrix capital V. So matrix rendering of the SVD, let me just write that down, A equals capital W sigma capital V, where W has the W's as columns, and that's therefore in C to the M by R. Sigma is the diagonal matrix with the singular values on the diagonal, and this might look this version of it might look more familiar to those of you. And that's in C to the R by R. And finally, V has the Vs as its columns. Up through VR. And that's in C to the N by R. So V Hermitian, Hermitian here, is in C to the R by N. Draw that bigger. Okay, so, so that's the singular value decomposition. We'll pick it up there next time and see why it's important. Especially, let's look, we're going to look closely at the case when A is a square invertible matrix because then it turns out numerical computations involving A depend heavily on singular value decomposition.